Things that happen in the real world can seem really random, just a series of happenstances that lead to a particular outcome. Like when I drop a ball straight onto a board with a single peg, there's a 50-50 chance it'll go left or right. Take a guess. Did you make the right call? No matter where I start, the ball's chances of going left or right on each peg are still about 50-50. So after many pegs, the ball could wind up anywhere, right? Here's the thing, lots of stuff feels totally unpredictable, but when you have lots of data, patterns start to emerge. I'm Sabrina Cruz, and this is Study Hall, real world statistics. When we're looking at data in the form of numbers, it's helpful to organize everything by frequency and in numerical order. Plotting a set of numbers based on how many times they occur within a given data set produces a shape that tells us important things about where the data tend to lie and how much they vary. Like certain graphs, such as charts recording the heights of all the goats at the county fair, or the amount they each weigh, or how much milk they produce, all turn out to have the same basic shape, the bell curve that has been haunting you without you even knowing it. This bell curve is called the normal distribution. In a normal distribution, data tend to cluster in the center and become less and less common the further out you go. It's symmetrical, with the mean, median, and mode all located at the same dead center point, and it's probably the most common distribution model you'll see. For instance, most goats at the county fair will probably have a standing height somewhere in the ballpark of 60 to 65 centimeters, with only a small number of goats with heights as tall as 74 or as low as 51. That makes sense, although there's some variation for data like heights, we'd expect to see lots of points close to the average trailing off towards really high or low values. But this approximate bell curve shape appears whenever we look at all kinds of data. It's essential for understanding randomness and predictability, like how likely it is that this studio is haunted. Because I keep hearing weird bell sounds. Is that just me? Now, when we see bell curves, they might look different sometimes. Some might be super squished or super spread out, but they all represent the same kind of shape. It's like looking at yourself in one of those trippy mirrors at the carnival. Behind this master of disguise that has secretly been following you is really just a mathematical function. It tells you the height of the curve depending on the value on the horizontal axis, which we generically call x. So in our examples, x would be a temperature or miles driven or how much milk a goat produces. It's the variable we are measuring and are interested in. The function x sits in has a couple of different parts. It starts with a number to the power of another number or an expression. Component. That basically tells you to multiply that number by itself a certain number of times. For example, 2 to the power of 5 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is... 32. For the normal distribution, the number being multiplied by itself is Euler's number, which is represented with the letter e. Kind of like pi, e is an irrational number, or a decimal that goes on and on forever. So like pi is 3.14 and on and on, e is 2.178, etc. It's a mathematical constant that comes to us from calculus, where it plays a special role in functions with exponents, including the normal distribution. Then there's the exponent itself, which is negative one half times a squared fraction. Unlike e, which is a number, the other symbols you see are stand-ins for things in your data. This funny u-looking thing with a long line is the Greek letter mu, and it stands for the mean of our distribution. And the bit on the bottom, which looks like a letter o with a baseball cap, it's the Greek letter sigma. Sigma represents the standard deviation of the normal distribution. We're gonna gloss over some of the details of where the specific numbers come from and how the equation was created, and just focus on helping you use it. Like for the group of goats at the county fair, if their mean height is 63 centimeters with a standard deviation of 5.9, we would expect a random goat to be somewhere in the range of about 57 to 69 centimeters. In short, here's what that function comes down to. When x is near the mean, the bell curve is near its peak, and because this is all divided by sigma, the rate at which the bell curve drops off as x gets further away away from the mean is inversely proportional to sigma. So when sigma is small, the distribution is squished and narrow, while when sigma is large, it's wide. That's what we might expect given that it's the standard deviation. A small value would mean small deviations from the mean, while a large value indicates larger deviations. Finally, this whole thing is multiplied out by a constant, which we'll call c. This number represents the maximum height the curve reaches on the vertical axis. You'll likely be typing this into a spreadsheet, but knowing the 
formula can help you understand what's happening. Like when you feel increasingly like something is following you around. Is it really just me? Now, this weird bell shape popping up in different contexts is a big deal. And because it's so common, knowing how to analyze normal distributions gives us insight into lots of very different kinds of data. But first, it's worth asking why exactly this really specific pattern turns up so often. The answer has to do with probability, which might make you think of the lottery or the odds of it raining tomorrow. The gist is that certain events have a particular chance of occurring, expressed as a percentage between zero and 100. Like when our ball hit the peg straight on when I used the boards, there was basically a 50% chance it would bounce one way or the other. But look at it after I let multiple balls hit more and more pegs. When we look at outcomes after doing something a bunch of times, they usually fall into a predictable pattern. In fact, we see this behavior for all kinds of events, but it's especially easy to see in games of chance because they're basically designed around tidy probabilities. With that in mind, maybe it's no surprised that as best as we know, the normal distribution first popped up in the context of gambling. In 17th century France, gambling was all the rage for the French nobility, and it left many of the biggest math-obsessed dudes of the time with a lot of questions about probability. For instance, the French writer Antoine Goumbou posed the following question to the great mathematician Blaise Pascal, who later made sure it caught the attention of Pierre de Fermat. How many times do I need to throw two dice to have a greater than 50% chance of getting two sixes? That question is a little hard to follow, but the easy answer is once if you use loaded dice. I'm joking, I'd never advocate for cheating. Never. But seriously, Antoine was basically asking if a bunch of people were all throwing two dice, how many times would they have to throw them in order for half the people to get two sixes at least once? 10 times? 100 times? 1,000? That would help committed long-term gamblers everywhere figure out how to bet. But that calculation is hard. We need to do a lot more thinking about probability before, many years later, a different French mathematician by the name of Abraham de Moivre came along. Building on that hard calculation, calculation, he went on to prove that in the long run, probabilities, like how often you roll a certain number on a die after 100 rolls, could be approximated really well with a simpler formula. In essence, if you looked at the histogram of events, like the sum of dice rolls after many rolls, the shape looked exactly like the graph plotted by a simple mathematical function. You guessed it! the normal distribution. We can get an intuition as to why, too, without even getting carpal tunnel from rolling dice over and over. When we roll two dice and add them together, we can get anything from two, if we roll two ones, to 12, if we roll two sixes. But if you look at all of the possible combinations, there are a lot more ways to get some numbers than others. Like there are six ways to get a sum of seven, but only two ways to get a sum of 11. So when we do risk carpal tunnel, or more realistically, get a computer to simulate it for us, work smart harder, not harder, folks, we roll 6 or 7 or 8 a whole lot more than 2 or 12. In essence, the bell curve tends to pop up when you're looking at data that comes from doing something that has the same chance of happening every time over and over, like a whole bunch of dice rolls, which actually explains what we saw with the balls falling on the pegs. That also applies to the process of gathering data. We worked on gambling and normal distributions for a long time and found them in a whole bunch of problems, like the mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss worked with them so much that they're now called a Gaussian distribution. Bell curve, normal distribution, Gaussian distribution, whatever you want to call it, that shape is following us around, whether my coworkers believe me or not. And not to alarm you any further, but it always has company. All of these things we've looked at, from balls hitting a peg to goat height, have some things in common. First off, we have a large enough sample size of data, and the process behind those data involves some kind of event that happens over and over in a nearly identical way. We needed many balls to hit multiple pegs before we saw that bell curve pop up, sort of like summoning Bloody Mary where you have to say her name at least three times. Repeated events, where every event happens independently of each other but have the same underlying probabilities, follow the bell curve. I can't stress enough how weird and incredible that is. Think about it. Just by having a large enough number of independent samples from which you calculate means in 
anything from goats to dice rolls to Plinko, the results will fall into a normal distribution. That is amazing, and as you can imagine, this result is so important that it gets its own fancy name, the Central Limit Theorem. Put another way, so you have some underlying statistical distribution, even if it's not a normal distribution. When you take a large enough sample, usually just like 30 or more, and calculate the mean outcome, or the sum of many outcomes, the distribution of those samples falls into a normal distribution. That's why the distribution of daily average temperatures, which are really the mean of the temperatures experienced over an entire day, resembles a normal distribution. But this also applies to complex processes that are themselves a kind of averaged outcome. The final height anyone grows into, for instance, results from a lot of environmental and genetic factors with their own probability distributions. And in a sense, the final height you reach is the average over all these different effects, which is why the frequency of heights for a given population follows a normal distribution. Proving this exactly involves some details beyond what we need for practical purposes. But if you're comfortable with calculus and your math senses are tingling, we've left some resources in the description for you to check out. Now that you're well acquainted with the shape following you around, and its accomplice, the central limit theorem, there's one more thing we should mention. To ensure the distribution of the sample mean falls into a normal distribution, its variance has to be between zero and infinity, which covers a lot of bases, but surprisingly not all of them. For instance, if you're measuring the time it takes after a coffee for caffeine levels to decline by half, the average measurements across your samples would follow a distribution whose variance is technically infinity. So in this case, the central limit theorem wouldn't apply the limit does not exist. But these cases are pretty rare. Now that you know that the bell curve is following you around, you'll probably start noticing it everywhere. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing, Sabrina. Come on, face your demons. Oh. It's kind of cute. The useful stuff we'll learn about this seemingly humble distribution will pay off time and time again. It's something we see a lot out here in the real world, and it'll help you make sense of why things start to fall into patterns and trends, even when that seems random. Good job, buddy. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall real world statistics course and earning a college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment what shape haunts you, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.